Hello, and welcome to Entry Point, where we take a deep dive into the latest entries from Encyclopedia Virginia with the contributors who wrote them. I'm Patty Miller, Managing Editor of Encyclopedia Virginia, and I'm pleased to be hosting today's program about urban renewal in Virginia as we debut our special section and new story map detailing a formative era in Virginia history that resulted in the widespread destruction of lower income black neighborhoods in the name of urban redevelopment. Encyclopedia Virginia is a free, reliable multimedia resource that tells the inclusive story of Virginia for anyone seeking to understand how the past informs the present and the future. You can access the entries we'll be dis discussing today and all of our entries at encyclopediavirginia.org. And if you'd like to receive a complete package of all our urban renewal entries and our exclusive new urban renewal in Virginia story map that shows in vivid detail the impacts of urban renewal, I'll drop a link in the chat to sign up for the next issue of our newsletter, which will be devoted to urban renewal in the Commonwealth. Before we get going, a couple of housekeeping notes. We will have time at the end of this event for questions, so please share your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. Also, this event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize with the closed caption tab at the bottom of your window. And now I'm really pleased to introduce today's panelists. We have a fabulous panel with us today that um, is really gonna give us a complete overview of the impacts of urban renewal across Virginia. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Johnny Finn, who is our section editor for this project and created our map. Uh, Johnny is an associate professor of geography at Christopher Newport University, where he is also the chair of the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Anthropology. We also have with us Hilary Malson, who is a doctor student, doctoral student in urban, urban planning at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she researches community organizing, housing justice, and Black life. Then we'll be hearing from LaToya Gray Sparks, who's a community outreach coordinator at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. We also have with us today, Jordi Yeager, who is the director of digital humanities at the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, where he runs the Center for Local Knowledge, the Mapping Seaville Project, and the Central Virginia Black Land Repository. And last, but certainly not least, we have with us Mary Bishop, who is a former reporter who won a Pulitzer Prize at the Philadelphia Inquirer for its coverage of the Three Mile Island nuclear accident and was a Pulitzer finalist at the Roanoke Times and World News for her investigation into the fraudulent practices of Virginia's pest control industry. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Johnny, who is going to give us an overview of urban renewal in Virginia and our new story map. Yeah, thank you, Patty, for the introduction, and um, thanks to Hillary, Latoya, Jordi, and Mary for their uh, for their contributions to these collection of essays on urban renewal in Virginia. I'm going to keep my um, remarks um, pretty brief. There's so much information between all of the contributions, and I want to keep my remarks brief so that people can hear from all of uh, all of the contributors. But I do want to set the table just a, a little bit with um, some basic background on what urban renewal is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I want to um, sh show a couple of uh, stills from the interactive story map um, that we created uh, and that is currently uh, just just been published on the Encyclopedia of Virginia website. <clears throat> so first of all, what is urban renewal? This is um, a housing set of kind of a set of housing policies that date back to the late Great Depression. Um, where the federal government um, used federal dollars uh, pushed through local housing authorities to clear, to tear down blighted housing in order. Initially, the idea was to rebuild uh, public housing in the context of the housing crisis that was brought on by the Great Depression. But very quickly, uh, in subsequent updates to the original 1937 housing law, very quickly, urban renewal became a vehicle for local cities and municipalities to clear and bulldoze black neighborhoods, not only low income black neighborhoods, but also middle and upper middle class black neighborhoods in order to create something new with that land. And as I'll talk about in just a second, almost never creating new housing for the African-American communities that were displaced through slum clearance. 
Um, and this is, I think, really important to understand the, the relationship and the interaction between federal policy and local housing authorities, because while the federal government was financing much of the urban renewal construction, it was being put into place by local redevelopment and <clears throat> excuse me, local redevelopment and housing authorities, which as a result, in the context of Virginia in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, in the middle of the massive resistance, which is this big backlash to Brown v. Board of Education and the civil rights movement more broadly, urban renewal became a way that local housing authorities could use federal dollars to achieve their own local segregationist and discriminatory goals in urban planning and in housing. Uh, and so broadly what we've kind of the different articles in this um, in this in this collection show is multiple different kinds of neighborhoods that were victim to slum clearance. The first, of course, were actual blighted neighborhoods, which for many generations had been sites of profound disinvestment, public and private disinvestment, um, that resulted in neighborhoods that lacked paved roads, neighborhoods that lacked street lighting, that lacked indoor plumbing and the housing quality. And so these neighborhoods were oftentimes targeted for some slum clearance. But in many cases, there were middle class uh, in vibrant commercial residential black neighborhoods. This is especially the case in Charlottesville and Vinegar Hill, which I know Jordy's going to talk about in Richmond and Jackson Ward that I know Latoya is going to talk about. These neighborhoods were also targeted oftentimes specifically in order to be able to disrupt black commerce, which was perceived to be competing with white commerce. Uh, and third, as was the case in Norfolk and other places as well, uh, integrated neighborhoods, the few integrated neighborhoods were targeted with slum clearance to create racial residential segregation where there wasn't before. In the case of Norfolk specifically, in order to preserve the lines of residential segregation in hopes after Brown v. Board of Education of th therefore de facto maintaining segregated schools. And so what we've seen across the state of Virginia is that uh, black neighborhoods were bulldozed uh, and in their place today, we see universities, we see civic centers, we see interstate highways, we see hospital complexes, parking lots, car dealerships, industrial parks, residential neighbor, middle-class white residential neighborhoods. And in a very few places, um, uh, housing, mostly in the form of public housing that was uh, built for the people who were displaced. But that, I want to emphasize, that was a, the tiny minority of land change, land use change, was for uh, housing for people who were displaced through urban renewal. Um, as a geographer, uh, I come at this of course, historically, but also geographically. And I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a, a cartophile. I'm a, a bit of a, a map nerd. And I think maps are so powerful in showing the impacts of this history. And so part of this project over the last uh, year, um, and I want to share my screen to show a couple of stills here. Um, over the last year, we've been creating um, this story map uh, of urban renewal in Virginia that really seeks to show how the urban landscapes that we inhabit that we inhabit today still bear the scars of urban renewal, which formally ended uh, 50 years ago uh, this year. Uh, and so as you scroll through this story map, uh, it tells the story of urban renewal across the state in Richmond, in Alexandria, in Charlottesville, in Roanoke, in Norfolk. Uh, and it really strives to kind of tell the, the complexity of this story through maps. And I'm, I'm, I don't wanna step on anybody's toes, but I just wanna show kind of what I'm talking about with how maps can become really powerful for showing what was and what now is as a result of, I'm. Um, as a result of urban renewal. So here are a couple of stills. Jordi, I hope you'll forgive me for uh, preempting potentially uh, one or two of the things you were gonna say, but I, I don't wanna actually talk about the content of Vinegar Hill, but rather right now just highlight what the, the work that the maps can do to actually show the transformation of what was a vibrant black commercial and residential neighborhood into what it is today. And so what we're looking at here, this map, 
is that as you scroll through, you'll scroll down, you'll eventually come to this map, which is the 1946 demolition plan for uh, for the Vinegar Hill neighborhood in Charlottesville. Uh, and you can see then it was kind of the, these different uh, renderings showing what it could be of retail space, of multifamily residential, of hotels and motels. But then using what the University of Virginia libraries have digitized of aerial photography going back to the 1930s, this one is from 1957, you can see that in 1957, this was a neighborhood. Um, by 1966, it had been completely bulldozed. Um, 15 years, nearly 15 years later, in 1980, it was still mostly vacant. And today, uh, a full 31% of the original Vinegar Hill neighborhood is asphalt parking lots. And through these map layers, you can really see uh, this change over time that was brought as a direct result of urban renewal policies. I'll talk about one more example from the map, and, and I, I hope that people will really dig in and spend some time. Um, the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company in the late 1800s and early 1900s created um, hundreds and hundreds of maps of cities all over the country. Uh, and this one is in the city of, Nor uh, excuse me, of Roanoke in Virginia. And I took these original map uh, plate, their, their scans from the Library of Congress, and in a GIS system, I, I added latitude and longitude points to these historical documents so that they become zoomable, overlaid on the particular, on the, in, the, in this case, in, in the city of Rono. And what you can see, see is this Northeast neighborhood, which was in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, a, a densely populated, vibrant black neighborhood Northeast of downtown Rono. And in this case, there's a slider and you can slide back and forth and you can compare it with what that area looks like now. And I'll just show that if you take that slider, that's the division, um, and you pull it all the way to the left, it is now uh, what used to be literally four to 500 homes is now almost entirely parking lots, the interstate highway, the Roanoke uh, Civic Center, uh, and this dramatic transformation of land that happened um, be from before to, to after. Um, finally, the in addition to this story map, I, I wrote the contribution for the city of Norfolk. And before I pass the mic to, um, to, to Hillary to talk about her contribution in Northern Virginia, I'll just say one or two things very briefly about the city of Norfolk. Norfolk, um, because of its close proximity to Washington, DC, and also because of the, the, the really strong military, the I should say the large military presence in uh, the city of Norfolk. Norfolk was actually the first city in the US to receive federal urban renewal dollars, um, specifically to uh, undertake what became known as Project One. And Project One was an area just to the east of downtown that was a densely populated African-American neighborhood that was severely blighted as a result of a long history of disinvestment in, in black communities in, in the city. Uh, and starting in the early 1950s, they bulldozed uh, all of this area and they rebuilt um, public housing um, that you can see here, this kind of uh, quintessential low, early 1950s low rise public housing. Uh, and this is actually the only case where six or seven different urban renewal um, uh, projects in the city of Norfolk. This is the only one that resulted in housing being built for the families who were displaced as a result of the raising, of, as a result of slum clearance. Um, but what they did is they built all this public housing, they encircled it with, um, oh, I'm going to skip that side, they encircled it with highways and other roads and effectively created or maintained the lines of racial segregation in the city. And if you fast forward, those, those uh, housing, that public housing uh, was built in the early 1950s. And if you fast forward now 70 years, Norfolk is now in the process of repeating history and the Norfolk Redevelopment and Housing Authority is once again, they've already started bulldozing that public housing to now rebuild privatized mixed income and mixed use um, commercial and uh, residential areas. So it's a bit of history repeating itself uh, right there on the ground in Norfolk. And with that, I hope I didn't take too long. Um, and I, wanna, I want to, um, I'll stop sharing my screen here. 
Uh, and I'll introduce um, my colleague and, and co-contributor, uh, Hillary Malsom, uh, to talk about Northern Virginia. Hillary. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, before I begin, I just have to say I'm from Washington, D.C. and have family roots in Culpeper and Alexandria. So doing the research for the Northern Virginia entry and learning these histories was such a treat. Um, so thanks again for the invitation to contribute. Um, there are three key points I want to make regarding urban renewal in Northern Virginia in particular. One is that the region's proximity to the nation's capital made it a laboratory for federal government experimentation. Two, urban renewal in the city of Alexandria was designed to transform predominantly black and mixed race communities into Washington's white suburbs. And three, in time, people could and did resist dis uh, displacement via urban renewal projects. So to the first point, um, DC was carved out of portions of Maryland and Virginia in 1791, and ever since, development in Northern Virginia has been defined by its proximity to the nation's capital. This distinguishes it from the rest of the state because it means that the federal government's hand has always extended its imprint into the region, long predating federal urban renewal programs. Even after the retrocession of the Virginia portion of DC back to the state of Virginia in 1847, the counties of Northern Virginia remained an integral part of the region's social and spatial development. The bi-directional force of influence flowed both ways. For individuals, the lure of employment by and contracts with the federal government called them to move within close proximity to the halls of power while the federal government regularly treated the city of Washington, as well as its environs in Maryland and Virginia, as a laboratory and landing pad for its myriad programs. I began my entry on urban renewal in Northern Virginia with a program that predates the official mid-century urban renewal programs precisely for this reason, to illustrate how that region of the state functioned as a lab for the federal government, and to situate urban renewal within a much longer and ongoing pattern of federal government expropriation of, of Virginia's land held by Black people. So in 1935, two unincorporated rural communities in Prince William County were targeted for displacement and redevelopment by the Resettlement Agency for the development of the nation's first Metropolitan Regional Recreational Forest Program, the Recreational Demonstration Area Program. The predominantly Black and unincorporated community of Batestown and the adjacent mixed race community of Hickory Ridge were the lands in question. The land that these people lived on was deemed to have been used inefficiently in the terms of the day. And over the course of several years, every household, homeowners and renters alike, was evicted. Not a decade later, the War Department expanded its operations from Washington across the Potomac River to de develop a new headquarters. This time, Arlington's all-Black urban communities of Queen City and East Arlington were displaced. Homes were raised and replaced with asphalt parking lots and the road network for a brand new megastructure, the Pentagon. In both the case of the recreational demonstration area and in the case of the Pentagon, the old displaced communities were founded in the Reconstruction era by newly freed Black people who had cultivated safe community enclaves for nearly a century before federal intervention. Regarding the second point, that urban renewal sought to redevelop Alexandria's communities of color into Washington's white suburbs. Alexandria, Virginia was the site, it was the hub really, of Northern Virginia's slum clearance and eventual urban renewal activity. In the 1940s, several black and mixed race neighborhoods near the waterfront in the city were condemned and eventually razed. Residents were sent to live in segregated substandard public housing. In the following decade, Alexandria nearly doubled its acreage size through annexation of surrounding lands, which included the Black unincorporated and semi-rural communities of the fort and seminary. Through this urban renewal project, Black-owned and self-built homes, middle-class homes, were demolished, and residents were meagerly compensated, if at all, and a new high school and a modern park were erected in their place. Um, back in Washington, urban overcrowding and the government's intent to enforce the Brown versus Board of Education decision in the nation's capital prompted thousands of white households to flee the city and relocate to the newly built exclusively white suburban housing tracks and droves. The white percentage of Washington's population plummeted between 1940 and 1960, and Northern Virginia took shape in the way that we know it today. 
Simultaneously, the Gadsby Urban Renewal Project in Old Town in Alexandria replaced Black-owned homes with public housing to accommodate the minority households who lacked alternatives given the rampant legal and extra-legal housing discrimination on the private market that squeezed Black households out of buying their own homes. Finally, to the third point of resistance. So you may have heard that James Baldwin quotation characterizing urban renewal as Negro removal. Uh, in 1963. And by the mid-1960s, the jig was up in Alexandria. Local Black residents knew what was coming when they heard their neighborhoods were targeted for urban renewal. The Bottoms, a Black neighborhood that predated emancipation, dating back to 1793, was targeted for an urban renewal project called the DIP in the early 1970s. Renewal funds were frozen by HUD in 1973 and during the Nixon administration, which gave community organizers time to strategically coalesce their neighbors to pressure city officials to abandon the project. City officials were sympathetic. After the gains of the Black Power movement, the city council was much more representative of the city population, with Black council members urging their colleagues to avoid displacement via renewal. Instead, the city changed its course, incorporated community input, and redeveloped the community of the bottoms with a mix of affordable housing, both own and rent and tenants uh, that prioritized occupancy by neighborhood residents. Um, I could go on, but I'll stop there and pass the mic to Patty and I look forward to more conversations during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Hillary. And now we're going to move with Latoya to Richmond. Bear with me as I Try to share my screen. Okay, can you see my presentation? All right, great. Um, so hi, I am Latoya Gray Sparks. Um, I work at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, and thank you so much, Patty and Johnny, for this opportunity. Um, I am someone who has been very much interested in, in studying urban renewal for quite some time. It started during graduate school. And honestly, like during a time in which I was doing research into my own family's history in Richmond, I'm a fifth generation Richmonder. And I must say that there was a lot about my own family's history within this city that I did not know about until doing more research in urban renewal. Um, I must say, so although my focus in grad school had been on urban renewal, a lot of my attention was focused on Jackson Ward, the Harlem of the South, as well as Randolph, which is where my family grew up. But it wasn't until this project that where I was taking a more holistic approach to urban renewal in Richmond that I realized all of the number of projects that were occurring back to back concurrently between the period of the 1940s to the 1970s. Um, and just the amount of devastation and planned destruction that occurred that targeted African American communities in Richmond. Um, it was honestly overwhelming. And I do hope that I've done it some justice, but I think there's just so much more that needs to be uncovered and revealed. Um, but I'm just so grateful that this is at least the beginning of a conversation about urban renewal. So my entry begins with the destruction of Apostle Town in the 1940s. Apostle Town is located, was located in Jackson Ward. Um, it was a thriving, intact, self-sustaining community. Um, it was concentrated in the center of the city. And when it was selected during the 1940s for um, demolition and slum clearance, originally the plans were to create military housing in that space. Um, what ended up happening is that there was public housing or one of the very first public housing communities, Gilpin Court was built in this area. And then there were more public housing units, communities created that were all concentrated within this within the section of Richmond. Um, as I mentioned, this was within Jackson Ward, which was considered the Harlem of the South. So luminaries such as John Jasper, Maggie L. Walker, William Troy lived in this area. Um, there was a lot that was um, representative of black excellence in this community and through urban renewal or the beginning of it, it was wiped out. 
Um, and many, there are hardly any remnants that remain of this prosperous community, and we are still dealing with that impact today. Um, another major um, development in Richmond that occurred was the construction of the Richmond Petersburg Turnpike in the late 1950s. So beginning in the 1950s, and it um, lasted over the course of many years. Um, it was so destructive and devastating that by 1957, it was estimated that approximately 1,900 Black families, households, which was approximately 10% of the city's African-American population had been displaced by the Richmond Petersburg Turnpike with another 300 households that were slated to lose their homes around that same period. My entry ends with the demolition and redevelopment of Fulton, which happened in the late 1970s. Um, and around this time, there was more resistance building against these projects because people saw what had happened in Jackson Ward and Carver, um, what was happening in Randolph and just were not, um, they were resisting just this massive change and displacement that was being proposed for their communities. So there were leaders such as Spencer Jones and Fulton, the Fulton neighborhood who fought back, who resisted, who used every avenue that they could um, to fight this, um, massive dis demolition and displacement of their community. Um, and unfortunately, um, that, you know, it did not fare well for them. But I just, I think like I'm at a loss for words because it, there's just this period of time where there's all of this displacement and destruction that's happening. And we are in many ways still operating within those displaced and erased geographies. As a student of urban planning, I began to appreciate even more um, the role of planners when it came to the creation of this destruction. Um, Harlan Bartholomew was considered the Dean of Planning. He was commissioned in 1946 by the city of Richmond to begin working on the city's comprehensive plan. It was the first comprehensive plan of Richmond, and he and his firm were hired to to survey, document, and map um, demographics in Richmond. Um, this is an example, or these are all maps from some of his plans. As you can see, there's a 1934 map which shows the distribution of the Black population, which is concentrated in the center of Richmond. And then we can see the areas that are declared to be blighted. They're classified that way, which makes way for, um, or creates an excuse for slum clearance and demolition. And then later the construction of the expressway and other transportation routes around city center. And if you look at this last map, you can see that essentially this concentration of the black community, they, they were choked off by the expressway and these other transportation routes that were um, created as a result of Bartholomew's plan and surveys. As I said, I, we are still working within Bartholomew's framework today. There are um, many disparities within the city of Richmond that are um, Race, that are aligned racially and geographically. Um, if you look at this life expectancy map of Richmond, you can see how life expectancy in certain parts, the part that was historically red line, that's in, um, demolished and um, declared to be slums. It, it's lower compared to other parts of the city. We have issues with evictions in Richmond that is plaguing the black population and other minority populations today in the city. Um, heat islands has been an issue as well that many people are fighting against and trying to rectify. And then, and as Johnny mentioned, um, you know, there's a repeat of history. So I mentioned in 1957, Richmond losing about 10% of its population because of development. And we saw that again recently between the span of 2010 and 2019, when Richmond lost its Black population or decreased by 10%. So in the name of redevelopment and planning that's taking place today. So 
the impact of urban renewal is still being felt today. Um, it was designed purposefully and it's um, something that plagues a lot of people today. And so I'm just very grateful to be a part of this conversation and look forward to hearing what my other co-panelists have to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, LaToya. And now we're gonna come a little closer to home for us at Virginia Humanities to Charlottesville with Jordy. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna try as well to share my screen. I don't know if it's going to let me. Ah, there we go. Can everybody see that? Okay. They made it bigger. Um, well, thank you all for having me and for, for this opportunity and invitation. Um, I really appreciate it both. Uh, everybody's remarks and, and Latoya, of course, I know that we've been in collaboration in terms of how the work we do has has affected each other because you're right, Harlan Bartholomew's blueprint is still very much among us and, and in us in terms of how we operate on a daily basis. Um, this photo that you're hopefully looking at is an image taken from shortly before Vinegar Hill in Charlottesville, Virginia was destroyed. Um, so these are some of the examples of, of the businesses that were torn down um, as a result of urban renewal. Uh, if you've ever been to Charlottesville, you've probably been to the downtown mall. These buildings look almost identical to the mud house or, um, you know, any number of businesses that line the mall today, uh, because, in fact, that street was the through line that connected uh, East Main Street to West Main Street, where Vinegar Hill was. And so you had white and black business districts that were adjacent to each other. Uh, prior to uh, their destruction, the black businesses brought in over $1.6 million in uh, income tax revenue. Um, and yet, as Johnny alluded to, there was a business strategy afoot, um, both among the city council, but also among uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the League of Women Voters, uh, the Democratic Party, uh, that aligned to push out black businesses uh, in the face of encroaching county development. Um, and so if you're familiar with Charlottesville, there's a, a outdoor shopping center called Barracks Road that was opposed to come online around this time. Um, and this was a deemed a, a threat. Um, but of course, we all know that there would have been any number of solutions uh, besides destroying black businesses. And so you have to get at the, the core of the why. Um, one of the things that I do, I work as the director of digital humanities at uh, the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, which is located in Vinegar Hill. Uh, in fact, those numbers that Johnny cited at the beginning, that 31 31 percent of parking lot, um, those are numbers we ran because we look at that parking lot every single day. Um, and so we're, we're staring at and we wondered how much of this is actually parking lot today. Um, and so we ran those uh, back in 2021. Um, but we've been looking at Vinegar Hill for a long, long time. And many people um, prior to me, uh, Scott French, Ann Carter, Reginald Butler, among many, many others have been doing this. Um, in fact, I, I was uh, privileged enough to make a film with Lorenzo Dickerson that highlights um, this called Raised uh, for PBS that looks at this lineage of not only how the de destruction occurred, but also um, the life that existed for about 100 years prior to that. Um, one of the things we wanted to do with this entry and also with much of our research at the Heritage Center is looking at dispelling myths. Um, and so this has been uh, pointed at in, in a number of folks' remarks today, but looking at how slums were used as the justification uh, for what was deemed blighted or what was deemed destroyable uh, through urban renewal. And yet when you go through, which we did, and comb through all of the assessments and the appraisals, um, you see time after time again that these are Black-owned homes that are deemed, uh, for example, this one says, this house is one of the best in the project area after the improvements indicate on page one. Um, these are Black-owned homes, right, and generational in many regards that um, in, in this example, uh, this house is an outstanding dwelling, well-built and maintained, custom-built from an architectural drawings from present owner, right? So these are people who are putting their uh, lifeblood into their homes. Um, these are not uh, lower income homes, uh, nor would that be justification for raising them, but this is a, a propagandizing of a neighborhood for the sake of uh, its destruction. Um, nevertheless, you find the assessments that do detail um, a, a, a more 
uh, inferior quality of structure. Um, and we can look at those, but this is an aerial photograph. Um, towards the, the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a, a large brick building on the right and then a large brick building on the left. Everything north of that is Vinegar Hill. Um, so there are about 500 people there um, that were displaced um, as a result. So these are some of the remarks of those inferior quality buildings. Um, and if you see, uh, you say a, a small two-story building with shed room and back used as a kitchen. The house is in such poor condition that all value is in the land. Um, so you see on face value that perhaps this is justification and maybe this is reason why some of this neighborhood should be redeveloped and or uh, rebuilt. Um, and yet when you look at the specific properties that are being cited, they all belong to one property owner. Um, and that really is the crux of what we should be looking at more, which is the who is how did this get passed? Uh, yes, a poll tax was in effect. Yes, there are racially discriminatory laws in terms of access to voting uh, and economic access. Um, but who are the power holders that put these measures into place? For us, it's our city council. Um, it's also the, the lobbying arms uh, of some of the aforementioned groups, but also uh, of the zoning commission and um, of city planners. Um, and in this instance, there's a property owner, um, and he was a former mayor and a former counselor. His name was uh, W.D. Hayden, and he uh, was the former president of the National Bank, and so in charge of making or not making loans to uh, homeowners, um, and oversaw the, the admission of uh, more than 100 different loans to racially restricted properties over the course of his tenure there. Um, but this is a very powerful man that owned property in Vinegar Hill, did not maintain those properties, did not insulate walls, did not put plumbing inside, did not uh, patch leaky roofs did not uh, maintain them to a basic quality of life um, and rented at a very low rate as a result. And, um, and those were the justifications for why uh, Vinegar Hill was deemed uh, destroyable uh, by the city council. We are doing a lot of this research and putting it into the African American Heritage Center. In fact, this week we just unveiled more than two years worth of work um, in an exhibit uh, we're calling Toward a Lineage of Self. And so it puts all of these uh, local, very local Charlottesville stories of raising eminent domain uh, land seizure properties, um, right? Because this is not a one-off. This is not a unique case. This is a, a pattern and a practice for Charlottesville. In fact, Vinegar Hill is the fourth land seizure of Black property by the time that it occurs. Um, and so we're putting that into context of what is the history and the lineage of Black property ownership that existed for the hundred years prior to its destruction, um, but doing that across the city um, and really trying to build out a framework using, as, as Johnny loves so much, the, uh, the, you know, the, car the cartocentric approach of map-based exploration of really seeing racial covenants next to uh, racially discriminatory uh, land bank policies, uh, next to uh, eminent domain land seizures um, next to the building of Black wealth. Um, and so um, with that, I will pass it back to Patty, but uh, I'm really encouraged by, again, as Latoya said, to see where this goes and, and really uh, see how much we can build and continue to build with it. Thank you so much, Jordy. And now we're going to move to Mary, who um, is going to kind of wrap things up for us. Roanoke was the later, the went through the end of the urban renewal pro period and much later than even some of these other cities, which is why um, we're going to talk about Roanoke last. And then we will have some time for questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A and we will get to as many as you can. Mary, it's all yours. Oh, thank you so much. And I really um, am so heartened by this effort. Um, as the only journalist on the panel, I'm going to talk some somewhat about the um, um, the role of the news media in the history of urban renewal, at least in Roanoke. Um, as a young woman, I I lived in I'm 79. I lived in Washington, New York, Boston, Richmond, Charlotte, and Philadelphia, and in each place, I wanted to learn the histories of their black neighborhoods, but I didn't stay in any of those places long. I worked for newspapers and my assignments for those papers were often about other things that kept me busy. So I would you know, leave each place kind of clueless in that regard. And more than 30 years later, um, or no, more than 30 years ago, uh, I did an unusual thing of going from a big paper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, to the Roanoke Times, and um, I um, I pulled weekend duty one Saturday in 1991 
I was given a little slip of paper by an editor and it had some names and numbers and I was told to go to a neighborhood reunion, which, you know, I didn't think sounded like much of a story. Um, but it certainly was. Hundreds of people who once lived in Northeast Roanoke, which you all have seen, uh, were getting together for the first time since they left. It turned out all those planes of flattened asphalt parking lots that I pass on my way to work every day had once been their home. That reunion led me to the, over the next few years to investigate how and why Roanoke's government had destroyed nearly all of Black Roanoke. People at the reunion first told me about their heartbreak at least 1,600 homes, which is a lot for Roanoke, a small place. 1,600 homes, 24 churches, several historic schools, including the very first school built, um, and 200 small businesses or more were mowed down in their place, the city, as we've seen in every place so far, built, you know, a, a um, an interstate, civic center, big central post office, motels, hotels, fast food places, and many others. And not only were houses taken, but hills were, were flattened and thousands of trees. And white Roanoke tended to see um, the, the housing in those neighborhoods. Roanoke by housing covenant cooperation of real estate agents and other means redlining among them um, hemmed in its black population for many years north of the railroad tracks. We have a quadrant in Roanoke and northeast, northeast of the tracks and northwest were where black the black population lived, was forced to live, I might say. Um, Roanoke's population has always hovered around 100,000, and that scale made it relatively easy to find people and hear their stories. Eventually, my newspaper under new owners would give me a lot of time to work on this. Once the people at the reunion had opened my eyes, um, I had a lot of, they were, the newspaper and the new editors gave me time to work on this. And um, I um, eventually published, uh, the newspaper published a 12 page special section called Street by Street, Block by Block, how urban renewal uprooted um, Black Roanoke. That came out in 1990, almost 30 years ago. So anyway, but the Roanoke scale made it easy for me as a reporter to find people. People could say, oh, you know, so-and-so lives now over four, four blocks over or wherever. So, you know, it seemed like I would be able to tell this um, without, um, you know, it was pretty easy to see what had happened and exactly where everybody had lived. But there was a catch all those decades when Roanoke's bulldozers were taking down Black Roanoke, my newspaper, as I say, under earlier owners, had barely touched on how urban renewal was devastating its Black families. Our editorial writers before my time in the 50s and 60s had in fact, of course, cheered on urban renewal and insulted the old neighborhoods calling them slums and, quote, unsightly and slovenly. And people remembered that. And so they, at first, um, folks I hadn't met at the reunion, but started going door to door and people wouldn't talk with me. And I found out that's why, because they remembered all of that. And because I was young then and knew at the paper and seemed, I guess I seemed genuine, um, people eventually opened up and they shared their story in this um, special section, which we're trying to have reprinted, by the way, around the time of its 30th anniversary. Anyway, 
I began back to newspapers and other media. I began a national search for other newspapers that had reported the full story of urban renewal from the ground up um, in their cities. But except for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution's 1988 um, series on redlining, I, I couldn't find anything. Um, and as I, I, the news media, I believe, and well, we can all see that. We know that it played a big role in advocating for urban renewal and is a story worthy of, of study on its own. And, you know, um, elderly white natives of Roanoke have, you know, have had me come to speak at their churches and, and residents of the old neighborhoods have been invited to panels at churches and clubs and other civic groups. And well-meaning white old people like me um, were puzzled by why they remembered so little of Northeast or neighboring Gainsboro, uh, another neighborhood that was impacted. And even Black Roanoke's busy commercial district, Henry Street, and it's because those white people, when, when they were kids, my white run newspaper failed to cover the cultural richness of the segregated black side of town north of the railroad tracks. It, you know, the newspaper, I went back many years on microfilm and in our clip library. And um, I could see that the newspaper and I talked with an, a former editor there it was very quick to cover a murder or a bootleg bust or something in Northeast or Gainsboro, but <clears throat> it rarely described the, the debutante balls or Duke Ellington's visits to Henry Street or the garden clubs or the black doctors and lawyers who quietly served their poorer neighbors. And when Roanoke um, began urban renewal in the mid 50s, the city had promised the inhabitants of the first streets taken that they could eventually rebuild their homes right there, right, you know, in line, the same uh, progression of neighbors it lined up. But I found, and I know that they did promise that because I found it in um, a, a buried deep in a little pro forma, City Hall story at the time on some back page, but nothing in Northeast was ever rebuilt. People have been looking for at least a rock or anything as a, the people who grew up there, there's nothing. So there is a sense of betrayal um, that lives on. Urban renewal was a 40 year slow moving horror show to the people who lost their homes and their sense of community, they really lost each other and they've been rebuilding those relationships ever since. Um, the, um, their descendants remain wary whenever our city proposes developments near where they live, for good reason. And people now live just a mile or two from the old neighborhoods. Um, they opened up the racial barriers, but the barriers are really still there in a way by by custom. Um, that racial line moved, moved again, moved again. And when people were forced out, lost their homes, sometimes getting very little money. At first, I don't think they got anything. Um, and many of the houses were um, um, rentals owned by white people who didn't, as, as we discussed earlier, did not maintain them. And yet people were, were punished for, um, the, the tenants were punished for that. Um, anyway, 70 years after urban renewal began, our city government is still trying to figure out how to apologize with what actions to apologize with and how to make decisions while also keeping our history of segregation and urban renewal in mind. Thank you all so much.
Thank you so much, Mary. And I'm going to drop a link. We do have a link. It's not as pretty as if they republish it eventually, but we do have a link in the entry that Mary contributed to the original block by block piece that's online at the Roanoke Library. So I just dropped a link in the uh, chat to that. Um, and I think it's a it's a really interesting reminder um, what Mary is talking about that every one of these city stories is a, is different and, and how it played out is a little different, but there's also a lot of commonalities. And one thing we try to do to the Encyclopedia of Virginia is really provide the resources to help people explore on their own what those commonalities are or what the, the various um, contributing factors to these development decisions were. And the media is a really common thread. And you can find in most of these entries, we've tried to find newspaper articles from the time and digitize them and transcribe them. And they're attached to these entries. So if you want to explore this in more depth, you can both see how the white newspapers portrayed urban renewal often is this, you know, this crisis of slums and uh, crime versus how the black papers portrayed urban renewal, which was this is a community, maybe it has some issues, but you could invest in this community rather than trying to bulldoze it because it's, a, a, you know, it's a community that obviously contains a lot of stories and a lot of different aspects. Um, so to kick us off, I wanted to ask um, anyone who wants to comment, um, Latoya used a phrase I thought was really powerful about these communities were displaced and erased. Um, talk a little bit for each of the communities that you contributed, you know, what you think was the major impact of that displacement and erasure, um, you, you know, going back either closer to the time of urban renewal or still what we can see today. What do you think is the, you know, the scar that that community bears primarily from urban renewal, if you have a, a thought about that? Johnny, I'll let you start because you're. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks. Just real quick. Thanks to everyone. These are such amazing presentations. I've read all the entries and it was really lovely to hear your perspectives uh, live. Um, I think in the case of Norfolk, the, the history of urban renewal very much lives in the present. In one in the Q&A, somebody put a question about the current redevelopment of Tidewater Gardens. This is one of the three public housing projects that was built in the early 1950s as a part of Project One, it is now in the process of being redeveloped. And it's an incredibly um, controversial redevelopment plan, largely because the, the housing authority that is undertaking this redevelopment plan in the present day essentially doesn't have credibility with most of the city's black population because of its long history of displacing black communities all the way up to the early 1970s with the um, redevelopment of East Ghent, which was one that I talk about in the entry, um, but I, I didn't have time to talk about it here. And so um, it's very much, um, the, the this history is very much in the present in, in as much as it mediates how people understand um, pre present day um, redevelopment efforts. Uh, and so I'll leave it there. Um, and I think I, I, that kind of mostly answers the, the question that was put in the chat. I can talk more about that shortly, but I wanna, I wanna make sure that my colleagues have a chance to also answer your question, Patty. I can speak about Roanoke a little bit. I mean, people died early. Um, I got, had many, many interviews where people said um, their elders died just out of grief. They lost their friends. They lost their support system. I mean, people would share child care and elder care and every, every kind of care <laughs> and love. And uh, they, they died just all of a sudden just went away. And um, so there's still, I think, a health issue, a uh, very strong in, and that that has uh, lived on, uh, and economics. I mean, family economics. That people had to go back into debt. People who paid off their houses, and we're talking a mix of all kinds of houses, wonderful houses, and you know, and worn out rentals. But um, some people had worked very hard and and fixed up their houses and lost lost uh, everything and then had to go buy in a formerly white area that was more expensive. So that the financial impact lives on too. Yeah, I just wanna jump in and thank you, Mary, for bringing up the health outcomes or results of this massive displacement. Something that I forgot to mention in my presentation is that I purposely picked a picture of Harlan Bartholomew 
later in his life. He lived to be a hundred years old. And so that's, he lived a long life and not many people in Richmond that I know African-Americans have that luxury. I have lost loved ones, childhood friends. I just found out about another classmate of mine who passed away prematurely because of the zip codes or where they have resided and or grew up. So those, so Harlan Bartholomew is long gone, but the impact that he has had on this city and on the lives of people has been just devastating. So there is a health outcome related to that. And I love that um, Hillary pointed out, Dr. Mindy Fully Love writes all about the emotional, psychological, and physical impact that this placement had on Black populations as a result of urban renewal. Um, I just want to say in, in the context of the Northern Virginia uh, urban renewal projects and displacement projects that these were really, really tight knit communities with deep, deep, long roots. Um, all the communities that I researched dated back to reconstruction or earlier. So we're talking many generations of investment in community, community ties, community building. Um, in the physical infrastructure as well as in the um, social networks. Um, so the, the really the havoc that was wrought upon these communities by urban renewal and displacement um, cannot be overstated um, and speaks again to Latoya just mentioned Mindy Fuller Love's work on root shock. I mean, we're talking about deep roots that were just disrupted and disconnected and uh, in other urban renewal case studies that I've looked into in, in DC proper and, and other locations, you, you do hear about these reunions, these neighborhood reunion gatherings uh, where people who never lived in the neighborhood are still considered part of that community because they're descendants of people who were displaced. Um, so I think the, the ties that folks had to one another and to place itself and to what they had built um, is really quite strong and needs to be um, taken seriously of what was lost. If I can just add one quick comment that is building on what Hillary just said and also, is also responsive to another one of the questions in the chat about the historic triangle here in Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Yorktown. The, um, I was invited several years ago to, to attend the reunion of a group that was displaced from the Naval Weapons Station um, that now it was displaced throughout this area. Um, and it's, it's just a, another interesting point. And in that case, it was a pretty rural area and it wasn't displaced as a result of urban renewal, but it was displaced as again, as the result of the, of the expansion of the federal government in the early 20th century. Um, so yeah, um, Laura, I'd be happy to put you in touch with some folks and connect you to some um, resources about these kinds of displacements happening in the historical triangle. And, and we have another question I'll throw to you all. We have a few more minutes because um, I think it's a good way to wrap up. Someone asked about uh, called the urban renewal that happened later in Roanoke kind of a zombie urban renewal because a lot of the urban renewal in the Gainsbourg section happened after um, formal urban renewal programs ended, but the city was kind of already on a roll and just kind of found other ways to do that. You know, talk a little bit about, I know Johnny talked a little bit about Norfolk, you know, what's happening in these other cities right now in terms of things that look like urban renewal are not formally, but maybe are still occurring like as we, as we speak. Does anybody have any insight about that? Well, in Roanoke, there's an area near our big mall, biggest mall, um, called Evan Spring. It's um, it's a neighborhood that's been there a long time, and a lot of people who were displaced by urban renewal moved there, or some people anyway. Um, and it is now uh, being proposed as um, for big box stores and other things, and it's being it's it's really one of the biggest controversies in town. But there is a, a you know, there is just much more um, awareness of how this history is gone. And a lot of people who don't live near there are getting involved as well as just about everybody who lives there. Um, and so hopefully there will be a, an, an impact. 
And in the lack of, you know, some local news coverage, I also wanted to know that uh, ProPublica has been doing, the nonprofit news site ProPublica has been doing a lot of work around the impact of urban renewal in Virginia, especially in Norfolk and how Old Dominion University kind of ate part of Norfolk. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another great resource, I think, to kind of follow what's going on currently. Well, we are, um, we are out of time. I want to thank everyone so much um, for joining us. And please... Uh, I encourage everyone to really take a deep dive into these entries themselves. As I said, every city is a little different and every story is fascinating in its own way. Um, and I really encourage you to spend the time to understand these cities in the entirety that really um, the map and the entries can give uh, more insight into. Um, thank you for our panelists and for everyone who tuned in. If you found today's event valuable, please consider becoming a supporter of Encyclopedia of Virginia. Your support does help keep our events free for everyone. And I'm going to drop a little link in the chat for anyone who would like to become a supporter of EV. You can also stay up to date on our latest entries by subscribing to our newsletter. And the link for that is in the chat. So with that, I'll say thank you to everyone for joining us. And hopefully we will see you next time on EntryPoint. Bye-bye. See everyone.